Welcome everybody. This is two EdTech guys take questions and share cool stuff. And, and I am going to ask a question that I would like you guys to respond to in the chat. So, so get ready, like hands and keyboards. Here we go. My question is this, uh, does, does this or does this not describe you? And, and answer in a one to 10. So if, if what I, what, I, what the description I give, if it is you, then put a 10. If it's just not you at all, put a one. If you're like, it doesn't apply, I'm not an educator, no worries at all. Put like N slash A. All right. So the, 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 the description is this. You have spent yet another week, another stressful week, trying to figure out possibilities for online learning. And you are darn glad that it's Friday and you have a chance to get some fun stuff uh, through, through a little webinar that you decided to subject yourself to. Where are you on that? Karen says that's a 10, 9, 10, 8, 10, 4. Kim, hang in there. Kim, <laughs> 3, all right. 10, 10, 10, 10. All right, cool, 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 good. So our whole idea, right, is that, is that we're going to be able to use this time to, to de-stress people a bit and still give them good ideas. So that's part of the idea. So we'll start with some thanks because that's just a good way to go. Uh, first thanks goes out to Richard, my partner in crime on this. Richard, fist bump, like at the boop, right there, that kind of thing. Uh, Richard, if you don't know, runs Free Technology for Teachers, which is a wonderful blog. Uh, over 15,000 posts over the last 10 plus years uh, with all kinds of cool things that, that can be helpful to teachers. So you want to check that out. Uh, we want to say, uh, say a shout out to all of our, our good buddies up in Jerome and Idaho and in Fowler and Central California, loads of good people there. The Merritt 20 folks with the Crow Center for Innovation at Foothill College uh, in Los Altos Hills, California. Good to have you as a part of this as well. And you should meet us. So with that, I hand it over to Richard for a little hello. Actually, I need to get a slide in there. Richard, for a little hello, go. <laughs> a little hello from Richard. I run freetechforteachers.com and practicaledtech.com. But a little bit more about me, I taught high school social studies for most of a decade through in a little language arts for a little while too. And then I spent, oh, six or seven years on the road helping schools all over the world develop technology integration programs. And then I had two little girls, Isla and Emma, they're three and two. And it was time for me to cut back on some of that travel. And so I teach high school computer science right now. I almost forgot what I was teaching for a second there. Uh, it's been a long that, week. That time of the school year, for sure. That time of the school year. I kind of forgot what I was doing there for a second. Yes, uh, computer science for high school students. So that's me in a nutshell. And my name is Rushton. I am a former high school teacher of Japanese language. I spent time as a middle school teacher of video production. I taught some college. I was a principal of a K-12 school and then an online high school. And then in 2005, I started my own little attempt to save the world from ignorance, one creative video at a time nextvista.org. Loads of cool things there that might be of value to you and your students. So videos about academic topics, uh, you know, shared in, in just short little chunks uh, about communities around the world, service to others, uh, English language learning, and careers. And so if you're interested in any of that, just stay in touch with me. So we've got two more webinars coming up uh, from Next Vista. Tomorrow we are doing a video to de-stress parents of middle school students. Now, I understand that the idea of de-stressing uh, the parent of a middle schooler is, is, is no small idea, right? But with regard to what's happening with online learning and, and how, you know, your kid who is on his or her way into middle school or maybe currently dealing with middle school or anything like that, uh, we got some advice. And I'm working with Tatiana Lagarde, uh, a, a British Colombian and, and wonderful human being who has loads of experience with, with home learning. And uh, we, we did one for elementary, uh, el parents of elementary students a couple of weeks ago. That went well, and so we're doing another one tomorrow. We hope that you will join that. Uh, next Thursday, uh, Susan Stewart and I will do activities across grade levels. In this case, engaging science stuff. And of course, the ideas are, are for everybody, not just science teachers. And what we wanna do is we wanna give you kind of cool ways to do things at different grade levels. So what does this look like for K2? What does this look like for uh, grades three to five? What does it look like for middle? What does it look like for high school? Uh, and we would love to have you join in if you are available and interested and if you are interested but not available, register anyway, and you'll get the email with all of the info you need. All right, here's what we do. Richard and I are, are looking at how to keep learning going. How do you use these different things that are available out there to, to make cool things happen for your students, keep them engaged? Because while it is certainly difficult to shift from in-person teaching to, to online teaching, I, yes, that's hard. Nevertheless, there are opportunities within it to, to reach kids who haven't maybe been successful in a traditional classroom setting before 
And this is an opportunity to maybe do some really good things with them. And our goal is to give you ideas on that front, uh, along with some resources along the way as well. So we're going to start with a few shares, and then we'll get heavily into some Q&A. So let's start with Richard's quick share for this week. Richard, talk to us. So this is one that I didn't even know existed. It's, a, it's Pixabay, pixabay.com. I've used it for years for finding pictures and video clips and some vector graphics. But I got an email this week from someone at Pixabay saying, hey, did you know that we have music? And I'm like, no, I didn't know that. They do. And there's a lot of it. And you can download it all for free, just like all the other pictures on Pixabay. And you can credit them. They encourage you to credit them, but you don't have to. Uh, it's all instrumental music. You can play it and listen to it first. Uh, but yeah, all kinds of great stuff in there. Download it, collect it, trade it, give it to your friends, include it in your slideshows, include it in your videos. Great stuff. Richard, do you know when I learned about Picked Up Music? When? That's when I saw this slide that you'd put together. I had no idea. That's really, really cool that that's available. I mean, there's a lot of good like music stuff out there, right? So you think about Incompetech, right? Uh, you think about the YouTube audio library, which is really cool. But man, you know, it's really nice that Pixabay's made it available as well. My little share is something that, uh, that, that may sound a little funky. It's the five-day teacher challenge. And you're like, wait, that, that sounds like a cleanse. That's not what it is. Actually, what it is, is giving teachers the chance to get together and for, for each day of it, they, they look at it and there are two choices, right? You know, try doing this or try doing that. And, and you and your colleagues are, oh, okay, well, I'll choose this one, you choose that one, whatever. And then you come back later and you say, okay, well, what'd you learn? And it's a very simple little thing. It's a thing I designed, so shameless plug, sorry about that, right? Uh, and it, it's on the RussianH.com site, all free. Feel free to give it a look. Um, a lot of the ideas are ideas that I pulled from, uh, from the book I wrote on making your teaching something special. But feel free to give this a look. And, uh, and if you and your colleagues give it a try and you're like, hey, wow, that was really valuable. Can, can, you know, can we connect with you and talk about it a bit? Sure. What does that cost? It's free. You know, no problem. You're like, what? Really? Nice guy. I am. All right. So anyway, there's, there's some good fun stuff out there for getting better at what you do. This might be a perfect time to do it as you're winding things down. Uh, but give it a look. Let me know. And if you have any questions, just, just send an email. We're happy to connect with you. All of the things that we highlight in our shares, we put on this page, the two guys dash resources, uh, tinyurl.com slash two guys dash resources. I will update that uh, in, in the coming hours with, with the new stuff that we've got. Uh, and I will also be sending you uh, an email if you registered to all of the, the info that we pull together as a part of this show. So it, it's a chance to say, well, here are the links that got shared in the chat, and here are the slides that we used, and, and here's the recording of it, because I want to share this with somebody else, and we certainly would love for you to share. So knowing that, it is time for us to get into some questions. And, and I think, Richard, what we're going to do today as we jump in the questions, I'm going to leave this particular slide. I think in the past, I've sometimes like left this slide a whole lot of visible for a long time. So, so <laughs> let's just jump into this with just our two mugs here and, and see how we do. So jump yeah. in, pick out that first question, and let's talk. All right, let's talk about the very first question. Uh, it's a little bit, a little bit long, but I'll, I'll try to cut it down. Um, I know that Google has an option in Google Classroom to check if a student borrowed, borrowed in quotation marks, work from a larger world of the web. So for example, I can see if a student copied from SparkNotes. I wonder if there's a way that one can detect if two students plagiarized from each other. For example, I teach four sections, each section has its own classroom. Work from every student across sections goes into my Google Classroom and it's all my Google Drive. Is there a way to scan across Google Drive so I instantly know if the work handed in by Alan in section A is plagiarized from work handed in by Bob in section B? So there is a way to do this. It's not an automatic detection thing like, uh, like Google's, what do they call it? originality checker it's not it's no, not right, right. not it's not automated like that but what you can do is you can do a quote search in your google drive and it will search for anything that matches within any document that's been shared with you so for example if max is in one class and mason's in another class and they both write the rain in maine falls on the plane somewhere in their paper all I have to do is search in my Google Drive that exact phrase, and it will pull up both of their papers. 
or if five kids do it, it'll pull up all those papers. So you don't have to, it's not just searching titles, it's searching within the documents that have been shared with you. So that's a pretty cool thing. Shameless commerce division of my life. I put, a, I put a, the answer to this on my YouTube channel like an hour ago. I made a video about, a, about an hour ago. Grab, grab that link. Uh, I'll, I'll add a few thoughts as well. So, so when, when, you're in, when, when you're looking for those things manually like this, right? You, you're, you're reading through something and, and just some phrase catches you as, as interesting, maybe because there's an interesting word in it. You know, like, uh, you know, like Richard was saying, you're, you're looking for that thing that's a little bit, a little bit different. Um, I, would, I have been for years talking about this related to uh, kids turning in, say, PowerPoint file. I mean, there's plenty, plenty of teachers who still assign PowerPoints. It's not to say that still is like a problem or anything like that. Anything that helps the kid learn is fine. You're using chalkboard and chalk, that's fine. Uh, however, when, when a kid turns in uh, or when a kid is assigned a PowerPoint slide thing, right? Just know that for that kid, it might be an issue of like going to Google and, and, look, and looking for something and adding, adding the phrase file type colon PPT. And they may find what other people have posted in terms of PowerPoints, right? And, and then they take that, change the name, not that all kids are like dishonorable, that's certainly not the case, right? But, but they may do that and then turn it in as their own work. Now, when you do something like that, the truth is that's not hard to catch. Right, and, and so all you have to do is is pick out the title or or one or one of the phrases in it and do the same thing. Put it in Google. Add file type colon ppt if if you are concerned that this may not be that student's work. Right, and you can imagine the conversation that follows. Young man, was this your work? Yes, it was. Really? Uh, why do you ask? Because I've never heard you use the word oleaginous before. Ah, uh, I had to look it up. You know, those kinds of moments happen, right? Um, and, but the thing is that the chances are real good. It'll appear like early in the search results because plagiarists are by definition lazy. Just saying. Okay. So anyway, uh, cool question. Cool question. Uh, Richard, keep us going. What's the next one? Yeah. And I should point out that Phil pointed out to me in the, in the chat to panelists, if you have the G Suite for Enterprise Edition, which is the paid version of G Suite, so it's, it will search across all 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 the domain for that match not just within your drive but i think most of our audience doesn't have the g suite for enterprise edition just have the g suite for education free version but it's good to know about it because you never know when when google will shift gears and say you know let's just add that to the free version right so so if 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 you're an educator and you're like i know i need that because of the nature of your work put in a request say you know give us the chance to try this thing out we want to kick tires we don't want to just be told to pay for it and figure out what happens next just saying. All right. Keep us going, right. Richard. So this next question came from Jenna, who asked, are there any programs available that would allow two people to record their voices on a Google Slides presentation who are in two different locations? My coworker and I need to create a video presentation with both our voices narrating the slides. However, since we cannot leave our homes, we're wondering if it's even possible. And you and I both came up with the same answer. Amazing. And that answer is Zoom. Zoom. So, so one of the things that, that you see happening, what we're doing today, right? We're connected, uh, we can share screens, and we're recording. And so Zoom, even the free version, allows you to do this as long as you're not doing it for hours and hours and hours, right? Um, and so, so use that that way. I, I find it to be a, a really easy tool to use. When you record in Zoom, it asks you, do you want to record to the cloud or do you want to record to your computer? Uh, the cloud is actually a very easy way to do this uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, but you, you do have some kind of limits to storage. The chances are good if you're keeping recording short, you're not going to run into it anytime soon for sure. Um, however, uh, if you are a person who likes to do a little bit of editing with it, you know, let's say you use iMovie or something or WeVideo or whatever it might be, uh, then you, know, you can record to your computer. Uh, and so you might also make that choice based on whether you have any history of frequently dropping the call. Like if you're like, boom, we're not in, oops, you know, that kind of thing, you, you, can, you can work with that. Yep. And I will add that my school, we just finished doing something like this. It became a massive project. Uh, got to be way bigger than it needed to be. But anyway, uh, everyone took their own, took their turn recording themselves screen sharing and recording just themselves talking about their slides. Ended up that we had then 35 little videos to splice together and 35 little audios to splice together. So I don't recommend doing it that way. 
but you could do it that way. So. Nice. Nice, nice, so nice. Other questions. Uh, the question, oh, it's not from Russian. <laughs> I see Russian's answer. Uh, I want to embed a link in my email with a short audio clip. What would you recommend? And my recommendation was to use SoundCloud or Anchor. Either one will work. SoundCloud is probably a little easier. Just include a link in there. Uh, if you want to get, depending on how long you need that recording to be alive for yeah. or be active for, you could even use something like Vocaroo, which has been around since the dawn of time, it seems like. Uh, and you can include a link to your Vocaroo recording that's quick and easy. What would you do, Rushton? I'm a big fan of SpeakPipe. Um, this, this is a really simple tool. Uh, take a look. With this, you don't need an account, which is really, really nice, especially if you're working with, uh, with younger kids, right? But you click Start Recording. I have so much important stuff to say, blah, 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 blah. Click Stop. It'll give you just three buttons, Save on Server, Reset, or Play It, so I can check and see if it sounds good. I have so much you know how the story ends. I then click save on server. I can add my name, but I don't have to. I click save. And then it processes it. Obviously, the longer the recording, the longer it takes to process it. And then it spits back this link. And so you can open it in a new window. You, know, you can grab that link, turn it in via you know, any particular tool, uh, Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams, Google Forms, email, whatever you want. If you follow it to a new window, you'll get that same link up here and also a download button. So if you want that as an MP3, you can. Now, if you leave it on their servers, it's only there for three months. So, you know, they're doing all this for free. They don't, you know, have, require you to create an account or anything like that, but, but pretty nice. There are some good reasons you might want to create an account for uh, SpeakPipe. They, they make some nice things available, but uh, that's one way to handle it as well. All right, yep, so a few options there. James just put a good question in the chat. So let's tackle that one. How do you have a meeting with only the chat for students to ask questions without their video and voice, like this one you are doing? So how do we, ha how do we set up this one? This is in Zoom, mm -hmm. and we just have people in without video and audio. Did you mute everybody remotely? I did not. Um, so, so there, there are two things. There are two things going on. In, in our case, it, it's it's a little easier because it is a webinar. So, webinar a webinar tool is an add-on to Zoom. They they sell it, right? Uh, and and I happen to have access to one of these things, uh, and so it it simplifies how you organize people coming in. If you are simply using a a, a normal account, uh, you can also uh, choose some some very nice options along the way. Right. So, you know, once you have everybody set up, you can click mute all, which can be quite useful. Right. Uh, you can also change who can do what in the chat. Right. And, and that's important in terms of trying to keep uh, keep people focused as well. So uh, it's a little bit extra work. Um, and then. Uh, oh, nice, Richard. All right. There's a webinar package for 15 bucks a month. All right. Yeah, I think I think don't quote me on that. I think that's what it is. I just used it last month. And I think it was $15 a month as an add on to your Zoom account. Yeah, yeah, check, check and see. And, and it never hurts to contact uh, people at Zoom or, or any educational company where, you, where you're kind of interested in what they are and just say, hey, could, could we kick the tires on this? Can we try it out? And you know, the worst you'll get is a no, but you know, thanks for asking. Uh, and, and often they'll say, sure. You know, they, they want feedback from people who use what they, they, and you've gone to the trouble of contacting them. So they're like, wow, this could be a great person to talk to. My experiences are about 95% positive with, with talking to people and just sharing ideas straight. Uh, and, and I think they appreciate that I'm, I'm rather blunt with them when I, when I think what they're doing is lame. Um, tactful, but fun. there you go. Yeah, you could also do, a, a, you, depending on if you're a G Suite school and depending on the permissions your G Suite domain has set, you could do a YouTube live broadcast and then you can do what we're doing and people can only do text response, text questions to you. So there's a great question in the in a chat that uh, that you may have an answer to. I, I don't. Um, in Google Classroom, can I set, oops, this is Camille. Um, can I set a timer for a quiz allowing individuals to answer their quiz for 10 minutes, then shut students out? Yes, kind of. So <laughs> uh, here, here's, what, here's what I've been doing. Uh, so there's a, a 
Google Forms add-on called Form Limiter that will let you set an end time for your form to stop accepting responses. So I'll, let's say I'm going to give my give my students a quiz and I'm going to set it to end at one o'clock. It's going to shut off. It won't accept anything else. Then in Google Classroom, I'll schedule the assignment so that it doesn't appear until a specific time. So for example, let's say I want to have I want to let kids have the quiz from 12:30 to 1. I'll I'll create the form, schedule it in Google Classroom to go live at 12:30, and then on form limiter in the form itself, it'll shut off at 1 o'clock. And Phil just added a link to uh, the form limiter extension. Thank you, Phil. So, Phil, you rock. Uh, don't let uh, him he, he, Hold on. Let me uh, form. Uh, he put that link to just a panelist, though. So. Ah, yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I can get that back in. I got it. You got it? All right. Cool. All right. Cool. All let's right. keep going. Okay. So let's take another question here. Uh, all right. How are we doing on time? Um, we're doing pretty good. Let, let's pull one from the group that came in and then, uh, okay. then we'll work with one that Heidi is, is asking as well. All right. So, uh, question came from Patty. Uh, how, do, so she's got a video project that she wants people to turn in videos for. How do I create a folder the community can drop their video into without seeing each other's submissions? I did create a shared Google folder but I worry someone with access will download and tinker with other submissions. Any suggestions? So I had three suggestions. The first two depend on your, the size of the files you're going to collect. Right? So if they're, if they're short videos, you know, the 30 second to maybe 90 second videos, which is plenty long, I think in most cases, you could do a Google Forms and have them upload to your Google Form, do a file upload. Uh, there's another service called JotForm. JotForm will also accept file uploads as a response to a survey question. Their file size is a little bit larger than Google Forms. Uh, and there's some paid add-ons you can get. If you, if you need a bigger file, you could even upgrade and, and pay for bigger files to be accepted. Uh, the other option, and I... I recommended this one to Patty because her blog was on WordPress. She's trying to collect it in WordPress. There are some WordPress plugins that will allow you to accept file uploads directly through your WordPress blog or WordPress powered website. The technical side of that gets a little tricky when you start having to get into your databases. So, you know, that's an option, but you're gonna have to feel pretty confident once you start cracking into the back end of your WordPress site. Cool, Heidi asks, can you embed a timer into a PowerPoint presentation? For example, I need four teachers to speak for 15 minutes on one presentation and be aware of how long they have spoken. Yes, uh, I have a video on how to do that. <laughs> also, I'll put, that, I'll put the video on in the chat here. Okay. But also, if you use the online version of PowerPoint, there is a feature called pre presentation coach or presenter coach that will display a timer, show you how long you've been talking for and show you all the ums and uhs and oohs that you make while you're presenting. So it's designed for practice. So depending on how you're envisioning using this, that might be a, a simple solution as well. But yes, you can put a timer into the PowerPoint. I'll pull up the video on that in just a second. Sounds good. Pull, pull up uh, one of the questions that we had from over the course of the week. Oh, so from the week, uh, where was I? In an online learning world, how do I help my kid avoid the summer slide? I can I can talk to you about that one. Matter of fact, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on a mild rant on on that front. Well, I mean, okay. a few ideas on that front. So if you want to pull up that that uh, video as well, and and also just kind of plant a seed. A uh, couple of questions in the chat about Google Meet. You need to come back a bit, uh, maybe to find some of those. Do, do know, everybody, that there's some really good information on, on Google Meet uh, from Eric Kurtz's uh, work, creating video tutorials on his blog, Control-Alt-Achieve. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work to find that one and make sure it's in the uh, show notes, shall we call them as well. So the summer slide. 
Um, now, as, as, a, as a person who taught language, I taught Japanese, um, it, it's one of those things where the, the slide is particularly hard on kids who are learning something like a language. But it's true for everybody. Now, the thing is that the summer slide is not a given, not a given at all. Oh, of course, we could pay a tutor to do that. Yeah, you could do that. But, but understand what's happening when you have a tutor. The content is being kept on the radar of the kid. Forgetting things is a function of it being off your radar for longer and longer periods of time. Now, with the last few months, you might even have, uh, you know, kids in a school where, uh, you know, th there's been very little pushing them forward. Let's just call it that. So, so if you know what should be on the radar and you, and you even talk about it, if not kind of get into the details of, of teaching it, but it's just on a kid's mind over time, that will lessen a summer slide in a big way. And, and so, you know, if you, we, we actually are going to talk about this quite a bit in tomorrow's webinar for middle school parents. Um, but, but when you look at these kinds of things and, and you say, I, I just need to know what should stay on the radar to contact the kids teacher right now. Right. Uh, and, and you as, as a teacher can be reaching out to parents right now and just say, here are the most important things for kids to keep on their radars over the course of the next few months. That will be a tremendous help to kids when they, when they start school in the fall, which may very well be online, right? Um, there, there are a number of different ways we're kind of looking at, at how school can be going forward. Uh, I intend to do a, a, a webinar for school leaders very soon about that, for, that front as well. You know, here, here are ways to think about how to get things going in the fall. Um, but, but for individual kids, keeping stuff on their radar. They don't have to go back and study every last thing just to talk about it from time to time so that it's just kind of in mind. That makes a big difference. Richard, what you got? That's all I would say about that. Uh, I, could go on, I could go on for a long time on that, but I won't because I want to answer one more question before we get off of our, our time together. Uh, a question came in, I'm sorry, I, uh, James asked, uh, our school system will only let us meet with students in Google Meet, and my students just stare and say nothing. Is there a webinar function for Google Meet? Uh, there's not a webinar function for Google Meet, but I'll, I'll offer my advice on the kids staring and not saying anything, which does happen sometimes. One of the things that I found really helped me with some of the kids who wouldn't say anything was just giving them the option to do a thumbs up, thumb down. You know, just put your literally just put your thumb up your thumb down if you're with me or if you're paying attention just doing that kind of broke the ice for a couple of my kids that you know and, and they were the same kids who probably who, I can say not probably weren't speaking up a whole lot in class to begin with right so even in the physical classroom they were the, the ones where I'd have to call on them to get them to say a little bit more so just doing that thumbs up thumbs down kind of helped so, so I'll jump in there as well. Uh, Susie did a nice, uh, a nice addition there. She said, you know, I've heard that from a lot of friends. You ask a question, crickets. Rem remember, this, this is kind of general teaching practice stuff in a sense. So remember that, that when you've got an entire group, you know, even if you're in the classroom and you've got them all in front of you and you ask everybody something, their responses are a function of speaking up in front of everybody, which loads of people are scared to death to do. So, so give people a, a, an opportunity to do some, some work together, perhaps, you know, just sharing things back and forth. You know, when you're in person, that's obviously easy. Turn to your partner and do X and Y and Z, right? You can also tell people, okay, I'm going to give you a question. What I want everybody to do is just jot a few notes as you go and, and then kind of start pulling some things forward. Also make sure that you're not always asking for the right answer. This is, this is what I would consider a mistake that a lot of people make. Not, not that the general question is a bad question, but we focus too much on it. If you always ask for right answers, most of the room will defer to the kids who always get the right answer. If you ask for ideas on things and what impressions do you have and what could be the answers, even if they're wrong, right? You know, what, what, what are things that come to mind? You can get more participation from kids as you go with, with just some, some adjustment of how you ask questions for sure. All right, I, seeing the time, I'm going to head back to our slides and wind things down. One thing that we do every week is that we, we stay online with, with the folks who are on the call and continue answering questions, uh, but we want to honor the, the time of people who are like, ah, I had 30 minutes, that's it. All right, fine. No problem. 
So uh, let's, let's finish this off. First of all, if you are willing to make a picture of yourself going, woo, right, like that, send it to us, because we would like to get those in as, as part of our opening slide on, on these, these pieces. Uh, as we do every week, we encourage you to, to think about your work in this direction. You know, we're, we're caring for kids, we care for their learning, and we do that best by caring for ourselves. You know, get enough sleep, you know, eat right, get a little exercise, and get away from the screen from time to time, because that'll kill you. All right. Uh, I send out a monthly newsletter. Uh, it has all sorts of freebies in it. Uh, so things you might want to read or watch or try. Uh, and, and I'd love you to sign up for that. Uh, when you get the email following this, it'll have some info for you. Feel free to give it a look. I write a lot of stuff. I've got a blog at Inspiring Improvement that, that desperately needs some updating, but I've been busy, right? Uh, I've written a couple of books, uh, actually three, one on making your teaching better, one on making your school better, and one, on, one for leaders on how to take technology and make things personally and professionally satis more satisfying for everybody on your team. Talk to us. Sure. So I have the Practical EdTech Handbook and Newsletter. The handbook is something you can get for free just when you sign up for my weekly newsletter, which comes out on Sunday night or Monday morning, depending on your time zone, also depending on what time I stay up till. And you can go to my YouTube channel and find anything you want to find about all things under the sun related to YouTube or related to Google, Google Drive, G Suite, all that fun stuff. Send me a question, Richard at burn.media or tweet at me. That's it. And next week, we'll do this again. Uh, if you are getting value out of this, make sure to let us know, right? We'd love your feedback. You know, tell us what you think. And, uh, and we're excited to share more ideas with you as we go forward. We want this to be a time well spent for you. Uh, thank you again for registering. Uh, you will get an email that will have some info in it. If for any reason you can't find it, contact me at rh at nextvista.org, and we're happy to share ideas. Uh, you can also send questions that way as well. Just however you get the questions to us is fine. We're happy to, to pull them together and to try to find answers to questions that might be vexing you. So with that, I'm gonna stop the recording and we'll move on to talking with the folks who are in the room. If you've been watching this as a recording, thanks again. We hope to see you again next week.